It is uh, incredibly sweet to be back with you uh, this morning and to see new babies, new faces, uh, old friends, and uh, we have kept up from afar uh, to watch some of the, the baptisms from a few Sundays ago, to see the testimonies and the new members just incredibly encouraged from New Orleans to see what God is continuing to do here. And just so, so thankful uh, for, for your continued labors and just the way you trust the Lord and pursue him as a church body. Um, I mean, we could not be, be more thankful for the way that, that we were sent and just the encouragements that we're constantly uh, receiving from you all. Uh, it's been actually 189 days since we were commissioned from here on October 29th of last year. <clears throat> and uh, we've been meeting now, gathering for 18 weeks in New Orleans, and uh, it is just thrilling uh, what we're getting to do. Um, I, I've been telling people nobody's having more fun in New Orleans than I am. Uh, just getting to prep and study and preach and lead uh, the, the team there. And we've got by now about seven to ten uh, people who've been gathering with us regularly. Um, we're not really sure who's going to stick yet, so it's kind of hard to know what we have. <laughs> But it's just been, uh, been such a thrill to be what for me is home and to get to do what I was trained here for, for so many years to, to go do. And so I'm, I'm in Psalm 119 uh, every, every week on Sundays. We're making our way slowly through Ephesians 5 and 6, dealing with the home and God's plan for the home. And so we're getting to think carefully about those foundational things on Sundays, God's Word, and on Wednesdays when we meet for midweek Bible study about what God intends for uh, families to just provide a strong, solid base for, uh, for growth, Lord willing, from in, or in the future. Uh, you know, every, every week we're feasting uh, spiritually and physically as uh, we, we just gather, we, we're small enough that we can go to a house and Pam Robinson is overseeing cooking for everybody uh, twice a week on Wednesdays, on Sundays. And so the fellowship's intimate, it's sweet. And I'm, my job is to make sure that the spiritual nourishment is as good or better than what the ladies are providing, uh, which is if, you, if you've tasted Pam's cooking, that's uh, no... No small feat. Um, just continuing, just again by way of updates, just continuing to meet neighbors, which is so much fun. Emily just texted me uh, yesterday that there were three new unknown children on our trampoline in the backyard. So word is spreading that uh, you can go to the Miles home and, and have fun, and, and we like that. We've, we've uh, extended dinner invitations and... Some of the kids in the neighborhood have taken us up on that. Maybe the first time they've sat around, you know, eating dinner as a family. Uh, and certainly the first time that they have read God's word, just while we kind of do what we do anyway as a family and read God's word around the table. Uh, and so we're building relationships and reaching out to, to neighbors and kind of getting settled in. All the, all the families, the Robinsons, the Dudleys are settle, settling into a, a rhythm of life, and so it's starting to feel uh, a little more normal. Uh, some things that you can be praying about, I just finished uh, creating a reading guide, which my plan is to annually create a reading guide that's going to encourage uh, reading from Scripture as well as extra-biblical resources so that over time we become a reading church, which is uh, not the case in New Orleans, especially New Orleans East, where we are. And uh, now I've moved on to just writing some foundational material, uh, pulling from bylaws here, constitution and bylaws, other places, creating a comprehensive doctrinal statement 
Uh, so those things are in the works. And then when those are finished, we'll be able to formalize our, our first members, <clears throat> uh, Lord willing, soon. Uh, you can be praying about the family retreat coming up in early July that we're going to take. We're going to uh, get away with the three core team families uh, and two other families as well in the Florida Panhandle for Monday to Friday. And we're going to be uh, over seven sessions. I'm going to be teaching us uh, about soul care, our own souls, caring for our own souls, as well as those of others. So this will be a, a way for me to teach heart shepherding and discipleship. Uh, again, just laying a foundation with these, these key, key families for, uh, for future growth. And so that's what's, what's happening in New Orleans. And, and it's just, again, been, been thrilling and could not say thank you, thank you, thank you enough to you for all of your sacrifices and labors and uh, training me here uh, and, and raising me up to be a, your pastor over the years and, and, and letting me practice shepherding on you. Some of you still have wounds. <laughs> so uh, just, just again, thank you. We're, we're incredibly blessed to, to have this church and the prayers and support uh, behind us. Right now, we haven't experienced any uh, problems, no, uh, or very little suffering yet, but we know that those days are coming because that's uh, par for the course in life and as believers and in ministry, uh, some form of suffering is coming. Job said that man is born for trouble as the sparks fly upward. And so uh, thankfully, when, when those days do come, we have passages like the one that we'll look at this morning. And so I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 73. passage and this entire psalm is one that is forged in the context of affliction. And so let me read the 10th stanza, the Yod stanza, starting in verse 73 of Psalm 119. The psalmist writes, your hands made me and established me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. May those who fear you see me and be glad because I wait for your word. I know, O Yahweh, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Oh, may your loving kindness comfort me according to your word to your slave. May your compassion come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. May the arrogant be ashamed, for they wrong me with lying. But I shall muse on your, on your precepts. May those who fear you turn to me and those who know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statutes so that I will not be ashamed. Let's pray. God, we are so dependent, even as we come to your word, open up uh, this passage to hear from you, to know what you say to us. Uh, we are as dependent even now in these moments, uh, those of us who believe as dependent now to understand your word and be transformed by it as the very first time we opened up your word or heard your word and believed it and were changed by your gospel when it came to us. No, we need your grace. We are in desperate need of your grace to have soft hearts to receive from you humbly. So, and so I pray you would use now the preaching of your word to accomplish your good work in us even those who may not know you, may not believe the gospel and have yet to entrust their souls to you, some of the children in the room, or perhaps even adults. 
God, I pray that you would create a new heart even in these moments as you love to do and that you would use your primary means to do it in the preaching of your word. And we ask all these things, not for our glory, but for your name's sake alone. Amen. As you know, suffering is a normal part of life in a fallen world. Everyone experiences some kind of affliction eventually, which is why one Puritan pastor, John Flavel, wisely counseled this to his Christian readers, quote, when providence frowns upon you and blasts your outward comforts, then look to your hearts. Keep them with all diligence from repining or complaining against God or fainting under his hand. For troubles, though sanctified, are troubles still. (laughs) Because of how common affliction is, as well as how crucial, really, affliction is in either moving us further away from God or closer towards him, because of these things, we could stand to hear from this writer of the 119th Psalm and what he has to say to us about affliction. This biblical writer stands as a preeminent example in Scripture of what to do in trouble. The entire psalm takes place in the context of affliction as this man is being persecuted by God's enemies. This is government-sanctioned persecution coming upon him all because he loves God's law, all because he would dare to follow the God who speaks, the covenant-keeping God of Israel, Yahweh. And he has come under the intense hatred and scorn of his persecutors. And in this particular stanza, the Yod stanza, we get a great glimpse of the role that prayer plays in affliction. As he makes one petition, one request after another, eight verses, he's going to teach us as a shining example of how to pray when we suffer. This is what we have to learn from him this morning. And so there isn't perhaps much in affliction that reveals the heart quite like prayer. Do we pray when we suffer? How quickly do we pray when we suffer? What do we pray when we suffer? How do we petition God in those moments? This reveals the heart, what we believe about God, what we believe about our situation, what we believe about ourselves, and perhaps most what we believe about the future. And what God has said about these things. So let's learn from the psalmist this morning. This stanza reveals that in his affliction, the psalmist has really four areas of concern. He has four areas of concern. He's concerned uh, with himself. He's concerned with his friends. He's concerned with his foes. And he is concerned with his future. Or to put it another way, this man is concerned with and and makes petitions to God concerning himself as God's man. He's petitioned, he petitions God concerning his friends who are God's people. He petitions God concerning his foes who are God's enemies. And then he petitions God concerning his future, which has to do with God's promises. These four areas are in his scope. And the way that the psalmist skillfully expresses his prayer, uh, even amidst affliction with these four burdens, uh, as they take shape, they really do take the shape of circles. Uh, What I mean is that the stanza, in the stanza, the psalmist, you could say, is praying in circles, usually doing these things, uh, thinking in circles, talking in circles, isn't a good thing, but here, Praying in circles is a very good thing, as we'll see. Uh, And really, here's what I mean. If you look at the stanza, you have eight verses, 73 through 80. 
and his first concern for himself shows up in verses 73, the first verse of the stanza, and verse 8. He's concerned with himself as God's man. So the first stanza and the last stanza, this first concern shows up. His next concern for his friends comes through in verses 74 and 79. The second stanza and the second to last, or excuse me, the second verse and the second to last verse, he demonstrates this concern for his friends. This third concern regarding God's enemies shows up in verses 75 and 78, the third verse and the third to last verse of the stanza. And then finally, right there embedded in the middle, his fourth and final concern regarding his future is in verses 76 and 77. So he is starting with one concern and then circling back around at the end. And then he moves on to another concern and then circles right back around to the same concern and on and on and on until in the middle, he kind of hits the bullseye. And so you could picture what's happening in this stanza as these concentric circles, sort of like a target. And so for, for our outline, the, the way that this will, will shape, shape up here is that God's faithful care for the psalmist amidst affliction compels him to pray in circles. This is what the passage is doing. Just structurally, it's laid out that way. Uh, the, the use the pulpit mic. Use the pulpit mic. Gotcha. Check, check. We good? All right, well, you just, everybody raise your hand if I go out again, and I'll know to raise the pulpit mic. So the, the structure really provides the, the, the way that we'll lay out the, the passage, and we'll look at these four circles in which the psalmist prays in his affliction. And the point is that God's faithful care, the psalmist knows that God has been faithful and only faithful to him in his care. And so because of God's faithful care, even amidst affliction, this compels him to pray in the way that he does. And you'll notice as he cries out to God and petitions one request after another, it's skillfully laid out. (laughs) We have a public prayer that's not just Uh, a regurgitation of words on a page, but he takes the time to skillfully lay this out. Uh, The the Hebrew begins as as each verse does with the same letter. Every eight verse section, every eight verse stanza begins with the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet that's a part of the genius of Psalm 119. So all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet gets eight verses committed to it. And in this one, the, the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the, the jot that Jesus spoke of, every jot and tittle must be fulfilled. This is the jot, the yod. The smallest letter of the alphabet even has to be fulfilled. <laughs> and here, what else he adds to just that structure, that uh, aspect of the poetic element of beginning every line with the same letter is what's called chiasm. And all that means is just a fancy literary term that just means the beginning and end of the work of the poem are the same, have something in common. And then the second and the second to last part of the poem have something in common and on and on and on until the main emphasis, what's being highlighted in chiastic tr- structure is whatever's at the middle. And so you can view what we'll look at as these circles. We're going to start with the outer layer first, circle number one, and then move in until we hit our target at the bull's eye. And so the first uh, circle, if you will, this outermost uh, layer or a realm in which he concerns himself is first a petition for comprehensive discipleship. Verses 73 and 80, a petition to God for a comprehensive 
discipleship. This is the first circle, the first area with which the psalmist concerns himself. Notice in verse 73, your hands made me and established me, or it could be translated, your hands made me and constituted me. The idea is that God is the creator. He acknowledges that this covenant-keeping God of Israel, his God, who is caring for him in his affliction, is the same one who created him. Not just some general, you brought me together by natural forces somehow. No, but your very hand, your power made me and fitted me together, constituted me, established me. You decided the way my eyes work, the way my hands work. You fashioned all of that together is the idea. Your hands made me and constituted me. And so here he prays to the one who made him and makes this petition for comprehensive discipleship because he asks the Lord in the second line in verse 73 to make me understand. Make me understand. This is actually the third time that he has made this request. He makes the same request in verses 27 and 34. Verse 27 saying, Yahweh is God and he has, or excuse me, Uh, make me understand the way of your precepts, so I will muse on your wondrous deeds, is the first time he's asked to be made to understand. And then again in verse 34, cause me to understand. The same word should be translated the same way, make me or cause me to understand that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. And then again, another prayer for comprehensive discipleship. Make me understand. Uh, Why is this discipleship? He's recognizing that he is in the position of a learner. This is what discipleship is. This is what the word means, is a learner. And so he appeals to the one who made him, who created him, to make him learn. Notice God's sovereignty. He's acknowledging God is the one in control ultimately of my own understanding, not me. If I'm going to receive instruction, if I'm going to be effectively made to learn what God has for me, he has to be the one to do it. It's not ultimately dependent on my ability, my education. No, I need God to be the one to teach me and to effectively instruct me. So he says, make me understand. Do you pray this way? God, make me understand. You have to believe God's sovereignty to pray that prayer. Make me, cause me to understand. And the result, I will learn. When God teaches you, go figure. You learn something. And this is comprehensive discipleship because in verse 80, when he's praying for himself, he says, let my heart come wholly upon your statutes. Again, he is in the position of the humble learner. So he says, let my heart come holy, or some translate it blamelessly. This word has to do with the completeness. So my entire heart comes entirely in a purified way to your statutes, your word, so that the result is I will not be ashamed. The only cause Christians have to be ashamed is when they come to God's word with a divided heart, an impure heart. That's shameful. But regardless of what the world might say about your firm belief in what God has said, there's no cause to be ashamed if you are whole, wholeheartedly, uh, pure, in a pure way, blamelessly committed to all that God has spoken. And so this is what he prays for, that kind of comprehensive discipleship. His entire heart coming entirely to God's word as a humble learner. You know, this is is good for us to remember. Just notice, as he prays to, to be instructed by God, God, teach me. And what's he supposed to learn but God's very word, the things that God has already spoken When God teaches you, he's not asking for a new word from the the Lord. 
He's not asking for some new tidbit, some novel doctrinal nuance or anything like that. When God teaches him, he will learn what God has already said. The connection that he makes here between praying to the one who made him and appealing for this discipleship, he recognizes that the wisdom that it took to create him and create the world is the same wisdom he needs for life. The idea is that the wisdom that it took to successfully create life is the same wisdom it takes to successfully live life. You cannot successfully live in God's world unless you consult him, the same one who created the world, for how to live in it. We should train ourselves to see God's astonishing wisdom in creation. And as we look through a microscope, look through a telescope, behold the way our own bodies work, You don't even need any sophisticated technology to do this. As your digestive system works properly today when you leave here and get lunch, take that as an occasion to remind your own soul, God, this is amazing wisdom. The way you fashioned me and put me together, teach me your special revelation for how to live. Make me wise to live the way you've told me to live. This is what's happening in this first circle, this first realm of petition with the psalmist, this kind of comprehensive discipleship. Circle number two is this, a petition for corporate well-being, a petition for corporate well-being in verses 74 and 79. And you see that his petition for corporate well-being is not just considering himself, but also God's people because he references in verse 74, those who fear you. And then again in 79, those who fear you and who observe your testimonies or keep your testimonies. (laughs) He's the one suffering. He's the one having a hard time. He's the one with every reason to pray for his own well-being in his current trial, and yet he doesn't get myopic. He's not the only one. His good is not all he has in view, but he also is thinking about the good of God's people. Think about this. When you're going through an affliction, when God is bringing some hardship into your life, do you think to yourself, God, Help me navigate this trial. The church needs me to navigate this trial well. Grace Bible Church needs me to faithfully trust you in my hardship so that they can have an example of faithful endurance right here before them, in their midst. As I suffer, this should be our mindset. Suffer for the sake of God's people. Even if suffering for God's glory and your own sake in a moment isn't motivation enough to suffer well, then think about the good of God's people. Will you do it for them? The psalmist prays with this in view. Those who fear you, those who observe your testimonies. He's thinking about God's people. And so notice what he's petitioning God for in this uh, corporate well-being. He's praying, first of all, that, verse 74, those who fear you would see me and rejoice. And then again in 79, let those who fear you turn to me, that they would see me and turn to me. (laughs) What he's essentially praying to God for is that the people around him who also fear God would actually look to him as an example of suffering, how to suffer well, how to faithfully endure hardship. Do you pray this? When's the last time you prayed, God, let everybody look at me 
all of God's people, let them turn to me. I mean, we're, that's a scary prayer, right? <laughs> the, the one who would dare to pray such a prayer is really the one who is so fixated on God's word, so uh, resolved to obey God that he becomes a worthy example. So if you are fixated, clinging to God's word in your suffering, if you are resolved to obey him as your highest priority, then this becomes an appropriate prayer. Let God's people, those who fear you, look to me. He wants to be an example. He wants God to use him in this way. And so he prays for the joy of God's people, even as they look to him as a faithful example. Let those who fear you, verse 74, see me and not just observe, not just see merely, but let their gaze upon me in my suffering be turned to joy. Why? For this reason, for I wait for your word. For I wait for your word. Let them look at me and see contentment under your providential care. Let them see an example of joy, of faith, enduring hardship. What's he doing? He's waiting. It matters how you wait, Christian. It matters how you wait. If the only thing you want, if your chief pursuit when you're suffering is to end the trial, you're not going to be a faithful example of how to wait. Do you rejoice in this, that God is giving you an opportunity to display patient endurance in trial? That's like the last thing we want to be thankful for, right? God, thank you so much for prolonging this season of hardship. (laughs) But he does this to make himself famous so that in our lives, as we endure suffering, our lives would become a sign, a finger pointing people to God to say he's worth waiting for. His word is worth waiting for. In this life, all of God's future promises means I don't need comfort in this life. I don't live for comfort in this life. Because there's, this is a blip on the screen. I'm here and then gone, a vapor. His promises are worth waiting for. I can, I can suffer. It's only for a lifetime. It can only be for a lifetime. And then what? A kingdom, heaven, jo- joy, and reward that far surpasses anything I had to endure in this life. He's praying to this end. This third, well, before we move on to the third circle, I want to just mention two impacts that this kind of uh, prayer would have on our churches. If everybody's praying, God, make me a faithful example and let people turn to me and learn how to faithfully endure, how to walk uprightly before you in this short life. If everybody's praying that, can you imagine the effect that that would have on the discipleship culture of Grace Bible Church? This would affect our discipleship in at least a couple ways. For starters, those who are praying to be looked to those who are praying like the psalmist to be looked to would be perfectly positioned to disciple others when our own lives are being recognized for godly living. Think about that. You're praying, God, let people look to me as a faithful example. And then somebody approaches you and says, man, I am so encouraged by the way that I see you living, by the way I see you walking with the Lord. Can you show me how? And you are, God, this is the answer to my prayer. Yes, I will step into your life, walk beside you, and just tell you, show you what I've been taught by God. He's answered my first request for comprehensive discipleship. I've learned some stuff from God's word, 
and by God's grace, you're seeing the effects in my life, and you want to know how to do it too, let me show you what I've learned. (laughs) Maybe I have a little bit, maybe I have much to describe for you, but let's walk together and let me show you. That's discipleship. And if you're praying for that, then it would be an answer to your prayer. No Christian, no matter how young you are in the faith, is too young to pray that prayer. The other way that this would affect a discipleship culture in the church is that if you're praying this prayer, if you know that this is a prayer worthy to be prayed, then you're not only looking to be an example, but you're looking around you for those who are examples. So are you humble enough? Are you so eager to humbly learn what God would teach you that you're looking around for other people who are walking the same path that you're looking to walk? Are you humble enough to see exemplary marriages and go to those men and women and say, can you show me how to do it? Are you humble enough to look around you at people who have some semblance of order in their parenting, (laughs) obedient children, not perfect children, but compliant, and say, hey, how do you do that? We could use some of of what I see happening in your home. What are you learning? That requires, above all else, humility and a willingness to learn, to just be humbly willing to receive instruction. You call that teachability, to be humbly willing to receive instruction. And if you're praying this prayer, then you're looking to be an example, and you're looking for examples around you. If, if that's the case, we, we couldn't plan the next class to teach Form, you know, formally teach the principles of discipleship before it's already happening in the church. And what a blessing that would be. Building Wellsprings start in September or in August. Can't wait. We got to disciple you now. You're looking for it, and, and I've been praying for it. And yes, take all of those venues <laughs> to be discipled as well. But this is what we should be aiming at. This is what the psalmist, as he prays in these first two circles, is aiming at. And thirdly, he actually also has his foes. He thirdly prays a petition for complete justice. That's what's in view in verses 75 and 78. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous, and in faithfulness you have afflicted me. And then in verse 78, let the arrogant be ashamed for they have dealt falsely with me. When he talks about in verse 75, God's righteous judgments and faithful afflictions, he has the same thing in mind as he does in verse 78. All of this, God's faithful afflictions have come to him through the means of wicked men, of arrogant, God-hating scoffers. Just note, while he's being persecuted, he says in verse 23 of the same psalm, princes are sitting and talking against him. They're taking counsel of how to upend and ruin this man's life. You've probably not had that problem lately. Government officials conspiring against you, And if this is Daniel who's writing this, then you see vivid illustrations of that numerous times. People plotting against him who hate God, who hate God's word. Well, he recognizes first that regardless of who the human instrument is, this is ultimately God who is doing this to him. And what good news that is. Who else would you want sovereign over your troubles, Christian? Isn't it best to have God who loves you with a perfect love, a love that did not spare his own son for you, overseeing all of your trials? The one who cares for you, loves you, 
knows best the right amount of affliction and blessing to bring into your life, to sanctify you, make you look like Jesus until he finally perfectly conforms you to Christ's likeness and glorification. He knows these things. He can care for you better than you can care for yourself. He is the good shepherd. And so the psalmist is thankful that he's the one faithfully ordaining his afflictions. It's almost like when you just see God rightly as an initial perspective. If you get God right and see him rightly in the suffering, then you start to see everything else rightly too. He knows that God's judgments, God's faithfulness, what God has decreed or judged for him, it is only right. It is only faithful. And yet it's still affliction. And so he prays not only as God is the one justly bringing this into his life, but then the completion of God's dealings with him in his just dealings is that not only that God would be just in bringing the affliction, but that God would be just in putting his enemies to shame. Let the arrogant, the insolent, be ashamed. Why? For they have dealt falsely with me. They brought lies against this man. And so let them be ashamed. It's been often and I think well said that time and truth go together. Are you being slandered? Are you being, is your character being maligned? What do you need? You need to wait. You need to learn to wait. When there's nothing else for you to do, learn to wait on the Lord. And when there's everything else for you to do, still wait on the Lord. He says, while all of this is happening, end of verse 78, what's he doing? Where is he fixing his attention? I, myself, or sort of an as for me, while they're lying against me, I will muse. And I think in the, in the Legacy Standard Bible, I love that translation, I will muse. He's uh, got his attention gladly fixed to meditate, in joy, in thanksgiving, to reflect on God's words, on his precepts. Listen, God's going to work out whatever he needs to work out on your behalf. Your job, above all else, is to obey the Lord. And you have everything you need in your Bibles to know how to obey him. And so this is where he fixes his attention. The, the final circle, which, uh, because it's at the center, becomes his bull's eye, is a petition for coming grace. A petition for coming grace. He uses that, what is, a, is our New Testament word grace, right there in verse 76. Let your loving kindness, your loving kindness, your uh, chesed, come to comfort me. This would be uh, just a hard word to capture in, in, in a simple way in the English, but it's, it's God's multifaceted, undeserved kindness, uh, almost always related to salvation for his people. And he prays, let it come. And then he says that this loving kindness is according to your word, to your slave. And then he restates something similar, let your mercies, not only is it grace, but it's also your mercies, not just singular mercy, but mercies come to me and I will live. And he prays this because your, your law is my delight. What's happening here? This isn't the first time that he's prayed this prayer. Just look back at verse 38. I think this is where uh, a focus on the future begins in this longest psalm in our Psalter. In verse 38, he says, make your word, cause your word to be established for your slave. Cause your word to be established, or literally make your word stand. 
And if you're taking notes, you can just write down these two references, 1 Samuel 2, 6 and 1 Samuel 3, 19, because the, this is an excellent way to understand this language, make your word stand. Samuel's father uses that in 1 Samuel 2, 6, where he says, only let the, the may, may the Lord make his word stand, meaning what you promised wife Hannah to do with our son, may God bring it to fruition. And then in 319, the opposite of making God's word stand is in view when it summarizes Samuel's ministry. And when, when God says that he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground, the opposite of making his word stand is to let it fall. And he did not let that happen in Samuel's ministry. So what's in view really is prophecy, the fulfillment of prophecy. To, for God to make his word stand is really another way of saying to fulfill what he said, to fulfill what he's promised. And so the psalmist has this in view. There is something that God has said to his slave that the psalmist prays would be fulfilled in verse 38. And then you get similar language as our stanza in verse 41. He calls this word that he prays will stand God's loving kindnesses. May your loving kindnesses also come to me. Or and this prayer that I've had, may your loving kindnesses come to me, O Yahweh. He calls it in verse 41, your salvation according to your word. You've foretold about a salvation, about grace to come, and I'm praying that you would fulfill it. This is what he's praying. And so just notice back in our passage, in verse 76, when this future loving kindness comes, it will be a comfort to him. It is a loving kindness or a grace that is according to your word, so it's been spoken about beforehand. And you'll notice that it has not yet arrived. It has not yet been fulfilled because he prays that it would come, verse 77. May your compassion or your mercies come to me. And when it does finally come, he would receive comfort and Verse 77, what? Life would be the result. What is the psalmist doing? What's he talking about, friends? Because this isn't the first time that he's referenced this, he's had his sights set on a future fulfillment of a future word. This is a future salvation. It has not yet arrived, but when it does, it will bring comfort with it. And the result for me personally will be life. He said already in verse 74, he's waiting on this word. He's already said the same thing in verse 49. God has made him wait on this coming comfort, coming life, coming salvation. It's not a temporal rescue that he's asking for. He's not asking to be merely delivered from his his afflictions. We know this because as far as we can tell, God hasn't predicted any specific word to him about his rescue from this temporal affliction. Uh, In verse 74, he's said to be waiting on this to come. Um, He's definitely not looking for a spiritual salvation because he's already saved. He's already been converted. But it seems to me that the, the best way to understand this, because this event would have to be an event in which he would live to see it, It's something predicted beforehand in God's word that the psalmist himself possesses because it's a future salvation that when it finally came would bring him comfort and life 
and it would justify all of the affliction that he's enduring as he waits for it, it would make the, worth, uh, the wait worth it, then we should understand this as the ultimate future promises to come that he's waiting on. Because when those future promises come, the ones that all of the saints preceding the psalmist, who are also suffering, patiently waiting, enduring trial after trial after trial, what they look to, as Hebrews 11 so clearly tells us, in faith, they waited for those coming promises, the ones that would come after death. They longed for another country, a coming kingdom. This is what the psalmist is waiting for. This is future grace coming when God fulfills his long-awaited kingdom promises. This is the bullseye of the psalmist's prayer, the realization of God's kingdom promises. And isn't this how Jesus taught us to pray? Do you remember the Lord's prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy what? Kingdom come. The first priority, the first request in the Lord's prayer for a coming kingdom. And Peter must have learned his lesson when he was taught how to pray because he passes on the same counsel to his suffering audience in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, when he says to fix your hope completely, fix your hope completely, wholehearted fixation on what? The grace, Old Testament loving kindness, to be brought to you when? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. Is this your target in your prayers? Do you know enough about the future? Do you meditate enough and muse enough on God's precepts? When you're reading your Old Testament, the law, because he says, I delight in your law. Your law is my delight. Verse 77. He got it. He was able to pick up his Pentateuch and read it rightly to see Abraham's waiting on things that come after a resurrection. He will have royalty in his own line, and the scepter would not depart from the tribe of Judah. There's one coming who will possess the gates of his, his enemies, Genesis 22, and none of those promises were fulfilled in Abraham's lifetime, in Israel's lifetime. They didn't see those promises. There is a grace coming when that singular seed will reign. I'm waiting for your word. And in his affliction, that gives him great comfort. Make this your bullseye when you pray, when you suffer. The kingdom saints will be worth it. It will be worth it. We will regret that we were not more faithful when we come to have our inheritance finally. When we receive our reward, we will wish that we were more faithful because it's all worth it. And so let's pray to that end now. God, you are such a faithful Savior. If you were not faithful, then we would not be able to entrust our souls to you to fulfill your word. We would be wondering, will you fulfill your word? And yet for us who have believed the gospel, who have tasted the fruit of Christ and him crucified in this age, God, we know that you will be faithful to all the rest of your promises. You will seat Jesus on the throne of David in Zion one day. And so what do we do now, God? Help us to wait. Help us to wait faithfully, trustingly, and help us to be examples of patient endurance like Job and all the saints who waited for that day, for all of those around us, so that Grace Bible Church here in Tempe, Grace Bible Church NOLA, would all link arms and we would run the race with endurance until you finally make us realize that day. We pray for all these things, for your glory, for your namesake. Amen.